Hi, Dr. Yamel here. Before we ended up going on break, we were talking about phylogenetic trees, also called cladograms. And depending on the class you were in, we might have finished going over it very quickly, but you might not have got asked questions, or you might have only learned half of this stuff. So I wanted to go over it again to make sure everyone's clear on how to create phylogenetic trees and also how to read them and determine data from them. So we're going to run through. Some of this will be review but some of it will also be new, so please pay attention. These are the important points. Phylogeny is looking at the evolutionary history of organisms with a focus on the relationship. And these relationships are commonly depicted as phylogenetic trees, or cladograms, that show these evolutionary relationships. And you can see the picture here showing a relationship between several different types of mammals. This is a fairly common cladogram, and we're going to talk about these in more detail coming up. Cladograms show lineages. Lineages are lines showing a series of ancestors and descendants over time. So a single point is a single point in time, and a line represents over time, multiple generations over a period of time. Those times might be fairly short, or they might be extremely long in the millions of years, depending on the lineage being depicted. Lineages often split, and we call those nodes. And nodes are where you get a split in the line, and this is an indication that often speciation has occurred, or two, a group is split into two distinct lineages that differ over time. In our cladogram on the left-hand side, you can also see red dots. The red dots represent the derived characteristics. These are new traits that have evolved, and new characteristics. And depending on when a characteristic shows up, dictates who is going to have that characteristic. For example, this characteristic here is derived, should show up in every descendant down the lineage going in this direction. However, it will not be found in that direction because it evolved after these two lineages split at the node. Cladograms often have show multiple nodes, multiple splits that occur, and can show multiple traits being derived. When you are trying to talk about common ancestors, common ancestors are the point right before the split, so you're looking at the node. For example, the common ancestor between this individual here and this individual here would be this node. This was the most recent time they shared a common ancestor. So a phylogenetic tree, or cladogram, is the evolutionary history, history represented as a branching tree that traces evolutionary relationships from an ancient common ancestor for a group of species. In our cladogram on the right, we have our common ancestor, right here, and over time, this common ancestor has been a lineage that is divided into multiple sublineages, giving rise to the great apes orangutans, gorillas, humans, and chimpanzees. The common ancestor is the root of the tree. That's where it all started. And then we have multiple branches to modern day. Depending on the cladogram and being shown, it might show you an explicit absolute timeline. For example, the one shown here, we have the actual amount of time. For example, humans and chimpanzees split approximately 5 million years ago. Or it might be more of a relative time. We know that humans and chimpanzees split more recently than they split from gorillas, but we might not be given the actual dates that that occurred. So depending on the cladogram, you need to read it either as relative time or as absolute time. A couple things to be aware of when you're looking at cladograms is nodes can be rotated. So these two different depictions of the cladogram, where we have chimpanzees on the top and humans second, or the second one on the right, where we have humans at the top of chimpanzee, represent the exact same thing. It doesn't matter which one you place on top and bottom, because the nodes can be rotated without changing the meaning. They still show that humans and chimpanzees split as a lineage at this point in time, and they both split from gorillas at this point in time. It doesn't matter which version of the cladogram you're looking at. They're telling you the same thing. 
So getting in the habit of realizing notes can be rotated can certainly change your interpretation. A taxon or taxa is any group of species that are designated with a name on the cladogram. So in this case, our taxon, we have chimpanzees, we have humans, we have gorillas, and we have orangutans. All of those are different taxon that are part of the group. A clade are all the evolutionary descendants of a common ancestor. So for example, humans and chimpanzees are members of the same clade because they share a common ancestor right here. Another clade would be human, chimpanzees, and gorillas because they also share a common ancestor back at this point in time. Okay? Or the exact common ancestor we write at the node. However, <laughs> humans, gorillas, and orangutans are not members of the same clade, or they are not a complete clade because chimpanzees are being left out and they're members from a same common ancestor. So a clade are all the evolutionary descendants of a single common ancestor. Next we come to a sister species. Sister species are two species that are each other's closest relatives. Looking at this cladogram, who is the chimpanzee's closest relative? Well, it's the human, because they share a common ancestor at this point in time. So chimpanzees and humans would be referred to as sister species based on this cladogram. So how do we draw a cladogram? Well, to draw a cladogram you need data. And so for example here we have some data about characteristics for four different species. Sharks, bullfrogs, kangaroo, and humans. These four species have some of these characteristics and don't have some of them. It's marked by an X indicating they have them. When you're going to draw a cladogram, the first step, and the key step, is to look at the mem different members and figure out who's different. This group represents the outgroup, the one that is most different from everyone else. And in our particular case, it is the shark. The shark has one characteristic in common with everyone else and none of the others. And so to draw this cladogram, you're going to start off with the root, the common ancestor that everyone shared, and then I'm going to split off and I'm going to write my outgroup member. So this is my shark. And everyone else goes this way. So next, we have to ask, who's the next one that stands out as different? And for this example, that would be the bullfrog. He has two characteristics in common, but none of the others. So our bullfrog now is going to be the next one that goes off. Bullfrog. And the others go this way. And then finally, our kangaroo and human are going to split. kangaroo and human. Remember, kangaroo and human, that node could be rotated, so it doesn't matter which one's on top and bottom, you'll still have the same answer. So that's how you draw a cladogram. One thing that's really important when you draw the cladogram, and I made a slight error here, they should all be the same length. If they're not the same length, that implies that a species went extinct, because this is a measure over time. So here's a challenge for you. Look at this table, You've got multiple characteristics. Go ahead, try to draw a cladogram for this. Pull out a piece of paper. See what you can do as far as drawing a cladogram that links all these together. Remember, start by looking for your outgroup. And then just each time, who can you eliminate as an outgroup? Who should be grouped together? Who should be separate? Go ahead and pause the video. And then when you think you've got it, come back and we're going to walk through this together. To do this, we're going to have to first look at who's our outgroup. Well, the one that's different from everyone else is going to be our lamprey. So our lamprey is our first outgroup. Come in here, and we have the lamprey. And so everyone else is going to go this way. Who's our next most different member? Well, that's going to be the perch. He only shares one characteristic in common with everyone else. So that's going to be our next one to split off. Go the same length as the lamprey, perch. Everyone else goes over here. Who's next? Oh, the salamander. It's only got two characteristics in common with everyone else. Here. 
And again, everyone comes off. <clears throat> now, who do we have? This is where it gets more challenging. We don't have a clear one that's different than everyone else. Instead, if you look carefully, we've got three here that seem to go together and two here that seem to go together. So this is where we're going to get more detailed. So our lizard, crocodile, and pigeon seem to be grouped together. So that's going to be a split going this way. Of those, the lizard, crocodile, and pigeon, does one of them seem more different than the others? Well, the lizard shares four characteristics, while the crocodile and pigeon share an extra characteristic. So that means the lizard is going to split off first. And then finally, the crocodile and the pigeon are going to split off from each other. So that's the crocodile and the pigeon. So we've got lizard, crocodile, and pigeon done now. We're going to go over the split and mouse and chimpanzee. I don't know where in here they split exactly. I'm just going to draw it right around here. And I have the mouse and I have the chimpanzee. And that's how you draw a cladogram. Go ahead and check it against the one you drew. See how you did. Better yet, go ahead and look at the actual official one that was drawn. You can see the different characteristics as far as when they evolved. So we've now drawn a cladogram, but the other thing we need to be able to do is read cladograms. And cladograms can actually be drawn in quite a few different ways. So take a look here. You've seen cladograms as they've been drawn in the book. That's how we've been showing them so far. But these are four examples of cladograms that are perfectly legitimate. Some of them are very straightforward and fairly easy to follow. Some of them are radically different from what we've been doing. But they're still depicting linear relationships between things as they evolve. There are, well, there is one major type of cladogram that the AP test likes to use. And I wanted to make sure you're familiar with that. And you're going to get some practice making those. So up until now, we've been drawing cladograms. Like this. Okay. On the AP test, you're much more likely to see a cladogram drawn like this. These two cladograms depict the exact same thing. They're just drawn a little differently. Our cladograms that we have been using show time in this direction. These cladograms, which are very commonly used, show time in this direction. They're showing the same thing. These two individuals are still closely related and common ancestor there. This is depicted here, our two individuals, common ancestor right there. This is where our outgroup split off. This is where our outgroup split off. This is our common ancestor from long, long ago. This is modern day. Here, this is our ancestor from long, long ago. This is modern day. So you basically are turning the cladogram on its side. So it's going up, down, rather than from left to right. But the meaning of the cladogram is still the same as what we've done before. So what characteristics can we use when we create a cladogram? You can use lots of different things. Traditionally, morphology, the physical features of an organism, were used to create cladograms. How they develop could also be used. Paleontology, looking at fossils, especially trying to get ancient lineages. Behaviors that we know to be genetically controlled. And more recently, we've started to use DNA similarities and proteins. More similarities indicate that two species are more closely related. And fewer similarities indicate they split further or longer ago. When you're creating a cladogram, one thing that's really, really important is what we call the parsimony principle. 
The parsimony principle states that you need to assume that a phylogenetic tree will contain the minimum number of evolutionary events necessary to create it, unless there's evidence to the contrary. So look at our diagram here. In this diagram, we have a blue bird and two red birds. This potentially could happen two different ways. We could have a blue bird over here, and the red coloration evolved two different times, once for this bird, once for this bird. Or we could have a bluebird here and red coloration evolved once and was passed down to both lineages from that common ancestor. When you are creating cladograms, you are to assume that the fewest evolutionary events, this one, are what happened unless you are told otherwise. Similarly, you are not to assume that a characteristic appeared, evolved, then disappeared, then reappeared, then disappeared, then reappeared. Cladograms would get incredibly confusing if we tried doing that all the time. Now, having said that, there are times in evolutionary history where characteristics have evolved separately from each other. Two different birds did evolve red pigment individually. However, when you're creating a cladogram, do not assume that happened unless you're told it happened. Okay? Assume the simplest explanation unless you are given a reason that a more complicated explanation was possible. Finally, reading a cladogram. Cladograms, sometimes you have to draw them, but it's equally likely that you will need to look at a cladogram and deduce information from it. So I have some questions here. Here's a cladogram. So these are the questions. And before I answer them, I'm going to read off the questions. I want you to stop it, stop the video, pause it. And I want you to try answering each of these questions on your own, then start the video again and we'll work through each of them. So first off, which taxon is the outgroup? So of these, which one is the outgroup? Second, are prosimians more closely related to birds or to humans? Identify the most recent common ancestor shared by birds and fish. And finally, are birds more closely related to prosimians or to humans? So go ahead, pause the video, try answering those four questions and then come back. Let's run through these questions. First off, which taxon is the outgroup? Remember, the outgroup is the one that split off first, the one that is least closely related to everyone else. If we start off longest ago in time, the first split occurred right here. That means insects would be our outgroup. So the answer would be insects. Are prosimians more closely related to birds or humans? So here's our prosimians, and the question is asking, are they made more related to birds or to humans? This type of question messes people up a lot, because if you look at it here, prosimians are equal distance from birds and humans. That's where the mistake happens. Do not look at relationships up here. Instead, you have to go back in time. So start with our prosimians, and go back in time. Right here, at this point in time, humans and prosimians shared a common ancestor. When did birds and prosimians share a common ancestor? Well, I have to go back here and go back. There it is. Right there is when birds and prosimians shared a common ancestor. Remember, time goes in that direction. So which one is more recent? this location, when prosimians and humans shared a common ancestor more recently than prosimians and birds. So that means prosimians are more closely related to humans. Identify the most recent common ancestor shared by fish and birds. Okay, well, here's fish, here's birds. So let's go. Following birds, back through time. When am I getting to a common ancestor? Nope, not there yet. There we go. Fish going back through time. That's the common ancestor for birds and fish, that point in time. And finally, are birds more closely related to prosimians or humans? So here's our birds. Are they more closely related to prosimians or humans? Well, when's this common ancestor shared? For birds? Oh, right here. This is a common ancestor for prosimians and for humans. So what that means is birds are equally related to prosimians and humans. They're not more related to prosimians or humans. The fact that birds and prosimians here are closer together means nothing. 
Remember, our node can rotate. We could have put humans and persimians in different spots, and it wouldn't have changed the cladogram. One final point I want to make. If you were asked to show when the most recent common ancestor of persimians and humans existed, if you were asked to circle it, for example, you would need to go in there and your circle would have to include the node. If you put your circle here, you would get the answer wrong because this is further back in time than this point right here, which is when the most recent common ancestor was. So always make sure to include the node if you're ever asked that. The last thing I'm going to leave you with is some practice problems that I want you to work on. In OneNote, we have a cladogram practice problem worksheet. One of my classes I handed this out to, and you got to work on these during class. The other class, first time you're seeing it. They're located in the lab activities, cladogram, cladogram practice problems. You can scroll in, and there's a series of problems asking you to look at a cladogram and answer questions about it. The first set of questions also have answers. The answer key is there, and an explanation about how to do it. Okay, so use those, get more proficient at these, get some practice in. Once you're done with that first set, keep scrolling down and you'll get to the second set. These cladograms are a little more complicated. They're actually taken from research articles. And when you look at it, I'm going to offer you a tip. <laughs> Don't try to understand the whole cladogram. You're wasting time. It's not necessary. Instead, read what the question is asking and then focus on just the part of the cladogram needed to answer that question. And once again, at the, at the end, there is an answer key. This answer key, however, does not include an explanation, so you're going to have to work through trying to figure out why it's the correct answer if you were wrong. But you can always come back to me with questions. Okay? So, that's it for cladograms and phylogenetic trees. You definitely want to practice these. They will show up on future tests, guaranteed. And that's it for today.